morning, everyone. We'll just give everyone 30 seconds to pop into the webinar and then we'll get started. All right, we've got a good crew here. I think we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Business Support Series webinar. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm Emma Mincheski. I'm Communications Manager here at the Halifax Chamber, and I'm excited to be your host this morning. The way we do business is changing. Organizations are more and more conscious of their environmental and social impact. We're not just doing business to just to make a profit anymore. We're doing it to improve the communities around us. And with this big change comes a need to reflect on the way that our organizations are operating. ESG, environmental, social, and governance is a strategic tool for organizational success. And our speaker today is going to walk us through ESG, why we should learn more about this strategy and its importance in today's business climate. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our presenter beforehand. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A or the chat box as we go, and we will get to them at the end when we get to the Q&A. So our presenter today is Nancy Foran of ESG Partners. With over 25 years of experience, Nancy has successfully focused her career on growth and diversification at the executive level, creating opportunities for social change while delivering economic value. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you for joining us, and over to you. Great. Thank you very much. You know, uh, it, it's interesting, we started out this morning, just before this started, uh, just talking about, you know, different presentations that, we, that we've given. And I must admit that speaking in front of a screen is, uh, is actually a little bit more nerve wracking than speaking in front of a crowd of, you know, five to 10,000 people. So <laughs> anyway, so I do thank you all for being here this morning. I thank you for taking your time out to talk a little bit about sustainability and ESG. And uh, again, a thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for both inviting me to present but also for supporting our local businesses through the business support series. I just think it's such a great initiative for uh, just for sharing knowledge and education. And I do feel really fortunate to be able to be in a position to help organizations and their employees to be able to understand the importance and benefits of ESG, how to integrate environmental, social and governance criteria into their strategies, and then to help them to share their story. Essentially, I get to help creation or organizations create and often recreate their path to purpose as they continue to evolve to meet stakeholder needs and demands in this ever-changing environment. So in looking at how we'll go about this morning, and I'll start by saying as well, we only have 45 minutes and because I do want to leave a full 15 minutes for Q&A afterwards. This is a big topic, not because it's necessarily so complex and, and hard to get your head around, but uh, because there's so many different issues which in and of themselves could warrant a whole hour or two conversation. So I am hoping to be able to just, you know, set the stage, set the framework, and then, um, you know, just to give you some exposure to what we're talking about when you hear about these different issues and then how you can start thinking about, um, you know, how to integrate them. So I will start by laying a bit of a foundation to talk about the key sustainability issues that got us here and what has led to this change in the business mindset. Then we'll look at ESG and the global community's response to supporting their companies and their stakeholders and helping to shape and define their needs. And that's what I refer to here as the disclosure ecosystem, but I won't spend a ton of time on that. And then after looking quickly at some of those tools and frameworks, we'll move into those more practical tips that can help you and your organizations to start thinking about ESG, how to start integrating environmental, social, and governance criteria into your business strategies, and to start thinking about how you might report. So the sustainability challenges and these images that you're seeing are um, sadly no surprise to anyone. They've been talked about, they've been reported on, and I think Netflix might have a documentary on almost every single one of them. So for anybody who wants to learn a little bit more, climate change without, um, you know, without question is definitely the most significant issue of our time. And it's a systemic issue. So we can't diversify away from it and it will impact virtually every aspect of business and day-to-day -day life. We're facing unprecedented threats of wildfires, drought, severe weather events. And just in the US alone last year, the cost of natural disasters 
was around $95 billion in overall losses. So it, it definitely is starting to, uh, to, to hit very hard. Biodiversity loss is being caused by changes in how we use the land and sea, overexploitation, climate change, pollution, and the impact of invasive non-native species. We've actually already lost 52% of the world's biodiversity. The water food nexus is an interesting one in that it's central to sustainable development. And all three, water, food, and energy, all the demands on all three is increasing because of the rising population, urbanization, changing diets, and economic growth. And agriculture is actually the largest consumer of fresh water, and more than a quarter of the energy used globally is used in food production and supply. And all three are so connected. So any strategy for, for, for any aspect of it needs to be considered together. Increases in waste is impacting our oceans and our marine systems. Burning trash causes air pollution. Landfills are reaching their max. And plastic is a whole other conversation in itself. On a positive note, uh, economic growth is leading to business reinvention, um, helping to bridge different industry sectors. We're reducing our raw material usage through more sustainable value chain management. We'll talk about that value chain piece a bit, a bit more in a little bit. And also we're able to harness data and, uh, and connect in a way that we never have been before. So there's tremendous opportunity in that. But sadly, human rights violations uh, continue and they've come into the public eye over the last year or two like never before with uh, social inequalities, cultural and racial violations, abuses of power, coercion, threat of violence. And finally, we continue to see the impact of um, increases in poverty and inequalities. And honestly, it's right here in Nova Scotia when we look at the conversations we're having around low income housing challenges and also in uh, gender inequalities that uh, COVID really helped to uh, shed a bit of a light on. Some of you may already be aware of this idea around the Earth Overshoot Day, but for those who aren't, Earth Overshoot Date a day is actually a date in the year that marks when our demand for ecological resources exceed what the earth can actually regenerate in that same year. So in 2020, overshoot day fell on August 22nd. And actually that was a little bit later than in the year prior because of the, the global shutdown because of COVID. But as you can see, even as early back in 1970, we didn't quite get there. So what ends up happening is as we spend our allotment in the current year of what the earth can give us, we're borrowing from future generations and future years. And we don't have any way to pay that back yet because we aren't doing any better. So every year we continue to overspend and overspend and take more than what we should with no ability to pay it back. And you think about a bank account, we keep borrowing and borrowing, but don't have any plan to pay it back. You get into a crisis and that's where we're at. So when we talk about the ecological overspend, it's actually a reflection of the fact that we are consuming between 1.6 and 1.7 times faster than what the planet can regenerate. So as a, as a final comment on this, um, there's a tool called the NASA Climate Time Machine. So just Google that um, after, <laughs> after this webinar and, uh, and take a look at that. And what it does is it shows the changes that have taken place in sea ice, sea levels, carbon dioxide, and global temperatures over the years. And it, uh, it, it's quite impactful. So just to put out a finishing note on that, I guess. So what this has done is this has led to the global community making some firm commitments around sustainability. So sustainable development is defined by social progress, economic development, and climate and environmental responsibility. So in 2015, the United Nations and its 193 member states, Canada of course is one, defined 17 sustainable development goals, also called global goals or the SDGs. And they represent the world's most significant priority areas. And they focus on the business's external impact. So it sets targets for year 2030 that aim to end poverty, protect the planet and fight inequalities. And so essentially the SDGs become a call to action for the nations and also for the business and industries that fall within them. So all of this has come to this rise of sustainable business and while we're hearing so much more about it today. Pressures are increasing for businesses to embrace sustainability, 
Customers' expectations are changing, regulations are changing, competition is increasing from mission-driven startups, and investors and funders are expecting more from businesses that they choose to invest their dollars with. At the same time, there's new opportunities for businesses looking to adopt a sustainable operating model. There's potential to find efficiencies that will lower cost, enter into new markets and new market opportunities, enhance relationships and collaborations and partnerships, and the ability to attract talent into their organizations that in this talent who are being drawn to a new mission and purpose. And there's uh, generally an understanding that you should be able to do financially well by also doing good. So as a final note, when we talk about doing well, we tend to get, um, we tend to focus a little bit on this concept of corporate social responsibility or CSR. And I've seen quite a few articles and, and um, uh, just publications talking about CSR and ESG sort of as one and the same. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to explain how they're, they're actually different. So CSR, or corporate social responsibility, is almost um, an organization's approach towards uh, philanthropy and to be able to give back to communities and to have their employees be able to give back and really become part of that ecosystem that they, they work in and operate within. But it in and of itself is not really an integrated approach towards a sustainable business strategy like ESG and incorporating environmental, social and governance issues in with your strategy. So hopefully that makes sense, but I just want to put that out there just because, um, because there is that, that perception that, oh, CSR, ESG, they must you know, pretty much be the same thing, but, but they aren't. And as we go through this, I think it'll become even more clear. So just to let you know where we are in the agenda, I've just talked a little bit about sustainability and the issues that are all around us that are leading to this rise in awareness of sustainability as a business issue. So now I'll take us into talking a little bit more about ESG itself. So when we say ESG, what do we mean and why are we talking about it so much now? And it refers to the environmental, social and governance factors that can impact the long-term sustainability and societal impact of a company. Environmental issues, I mean, they're, they're listed here, but they include things like climate change, energy management, emissions and biodiversity, Social issues uh, typically surround labor practices, human rights, product safety, employee health and wellness. And governance covers areas such as board oversight, risk management, uh, ethics, and compensation policies. The adoption of ESG is actually driven by the investment community's need to have an objective approach to decision-making where they could start to look at the risks and the opportunities that companies are facing so initially so that they could understand them, but also to price them appropriately within their portfolio. But 2020, or yeah, 2020 really saw a bit of an acceleration in the investment community towards taking action around sustainability and the decision-making and almost kind of raising it a notch. Um, BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world, led the charge when their CEO, Larry Fink, wrote his annual letter to his, the CEOs of his portfolio companies and he said that his firm would avoid investments in companies that present a high sustainability related risk. This moved the conversation beyond just pricing assets appropriately to actually starting to force action by saying that they no longer wish to engage in companies that weren't at least taking action toward a better future. It's not to suggest that BlackRock is just gonna start you know, dropping its portfolio companies overnight, but really starting to change that conversation into highlighting what's important and what's everyone's role in this. So what this is doing is setting higher expectations for all businesses to play a pivotal role in addressing the key challenges that we're faced with, and not just related to climate change itself, but also with inequality, diversity, data security, these are ESG factors that truly impact business, businesses and their ability to be resilient in the years to come. And that's a big part of this is just business resiliency and being able to adapt and morph into, into, a, into a, new, a new place as the environment around them forces them to. So the environmental, social and governance risks that businesses are going to face are for the most part unprecedented. We can't look to the past to predict the future any longer. And this is a game changer. 
So ESG is becoming that lens through which all stakeholders, not just investors, but consumers, employees, regulators, and a variety of others are making decisions about the companies that they're either going to or not going to engage with and how they want those companies to engage with them. So where we are right now in the agenda, I just want to make sure that we sort of keep coming back to this, you know, where, where we are in the whole conversation. Um, so we have talked about sustainability as a business issue and how that led to the advent of ESG. But now I'd like to just take a couple of minutes without going into tremendous detail, but just to look at the way that the global business community is responding. And that's sort of what I'm referring to as the, uh, the disclosure ecosystem. So the rise in expectations for companies to care much more than about just making money, it's led to the need for greater transparency and accountability from businesses. The global community has definitely responded to this by addressing this need through uh, sustainability standards and frameworks and opportunities to disclose the information and to track the information. There are probably over 100 environmental, social, and governance standards, uh, reporting frameworks, um, surveys, all those sorts of things in, ex in existence today that make up that disclosure ecosystem. And it's all aimed at meeting the information needs, primarily for investors, but also for society as a whole. And that's where things are starting to move to. Everyone's caring, not just the investment community. But, but I'll, I'll take a quick minute just to sort of point out that we've seen a lot of these issues around us for years and decades, but it's not until the investment community really stood up and made us see how that's gonna affect business on a day-to-day -day basis that we really started to embrace the change. So there needs to be a catalyst sometimes for change. And I think um, this, this community rallying behind it is that catalyst for change. So disclosure, so there's sort of three buckets, if you will. There's disclosure guidance, standards, and frameworks. And what they do is they help organizations prepare data and reports in, in, a, in a way that presents the information in a way that it's, it's useful and it can be relied on. Data aggreg aggregators uh, focus on gathering data from a variety of sources so that investors and stakeholders can actually pull information from one source. But what these data aggregators do is there's sort of almost two types, if you will. They'll either go out and find the information using a variety of algorithms, or they ask voluntarily for companies and, um, and entities to voluntarily report into their systems. So that data can then be used by others to make decisions. And then uh, we have uh, ratings and analytics providers. And what they do is unlike the data aggregators, which primarily just provide the data to the clients, these rating agencies actually use unique methodology to start scoring and ranking companies based on their comparative ESG assessments. So it, it starts to really um, change how companies are being evaluated. So I'm going to look at them in a bit more detail, but once you see the slides coming up, don't get overwhelmed because it, we'll just go through them quickly. So this gives a sense of the standards and frameworks that are out there. Some of these may be familiar to some of you, some of them maybe not. Uh, we've got like the, the SASB, which is just the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. That's more investor focused, looks at financial materiality of the different risks that businesses may face. And it definitely does look at it from that investor lens. The GRI, it's based in Europe. It looks at it from a, a perspective of the stakeholders, looking at the environment, society, and the economy, and look more at the impacts as opposed to necessarily financial materiality. The TCFD is a really interesting one that I'll just um, sort of end on is, is, is the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And um, Mark Carney actually used to be uh, Governor of Bank of Canada. He was very involved with this. And, what it does is it actually uses um, climate as a way to, it, well, it, it focuses on climate related risks and looks at the financial impacts that a company will face because of them. And it, it adopts a forward looking focus to start to predict what business issues could result as a result of the changing climate and the changing planet around us. And it looks at transition and physical risks, and it looks at um, metrics around it. 
So it, it just because it is such a forward looking um, framework and they actually use I and mean, strongly recommend um, scenario analysis to start looking at different scenarios in a given state. Like, you know, what would, what would the world look like in a two degree um, you know, warmer planet? What would that mean as far as regulation changes go or customer buying habits and all those sorts of things? So it, it really is quite an interesting tool. And then, of course, we already talked about the SDGs, and then you have the Integrated Reporting and uh, Climate Disclosure Board. So then we have data aggregators. I already talked about those. When you start looking at things like the Iris Plus, uh, there are more impact focus. B Analytics, some of you may be uh, familiar with B Corps or uh, benefit corporations. They help track some of the data in there. Um, Gresby is, is really focused on real estates and real assets. And these are those voluntary um, frameworks I talked about where you actually put the information in during a certain you know, window in time, everybody uploads their information and then um, you can see how you rank against your peers. Others like Bloomberg will just go in and get the information and pull it together. One thing I wanted to mention here about the CDP. Now that's an organization, uh, it was formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, but now just go under CDP. What they do is they cross over providing guidance, but also as a data aggregator. And um, they sort of help to um, shape you know, knowledge, but also tracking information for cities, municipalities, regions, and companies too, of course. And what's great about it, and the reason I wanted to mention it, is that our city of Halifax actually reports into the CDP, making it one of only a handful of Canadian cities to do so. So when I saw that and, and learned that, I was quite excited. <laughs> so congratulations, Halifax. And then finally, we have a few examples of those um, rating and analytic uh, providers who help um, develop those ESG scores and rankings. So as you can see, it's quite a busy environment, but the great thing is what it's done is it's proven that there's almost a solution for every possible scenario. And while that's great and it provides a great deal of flexibility for companies and industries in the way that they report and what they report, it does cause a lot of confusion. And a lot of companies are left with wondering, how do I even start on this journey when there are so many opportunities and options for me to draw from? So there is a great deal of collaboration and convergence in this sustainability reporting space. Um, the IRFRS Foundation, which oversees our international financial reporting standards, is receiving strong support to become the oversight body to also oversee sustainability reporting. And the five leading standard setters globally have committed to work together under a joint vision. And uh, two of those, which we saw in the previous slide, the SASB and the IIRC, already announced last year that they intend to merge under the Value Reporting Foundation. So a lot of stuff going on, and I expect by the end of this calendar year, we're going to see some real movement in this sustainability reporting space to make it easier for everybody. So with all that in mind, we just covered sustainability context reporting ecosystem that's driving so much of this momentum around ESG adoption. Now I'd like to turn our conversation to ESG considerations and how we can actually move toward integrating ESG criteria into your own business and your own business strategies and then also talk a little bit about what to look out for. So I'll start with the important questions. So why should a company, why should you even consider implementing or integrating environmental, social and governance factors into your strategy, into your business operational mindset? Who should be doing this? When is the right time to start? And how can you get started? So the why, uh, because the traditional model isn't working anymore. It's become apparent that we need to start shifting our focus to what the what the definition of stakeholder is and who our stakeholders are. And it's no longer this mindset that um, who we're making money for, it's more so who are the broader community. And the environment is actually considered one of those important stakeholders in that broader stakeholder community. Improving performance around issues that pertain to the environment, society, and internal governance, it's, Improving that performance will impact your company through its operations, health and safety of your workforce, uh, the, the way that you respect and engage with the environment, and the impact you have on people and the communities that you're working in. 
and it can lead directly to improved business performance and profitability. And increasingly, we're seeing much more evidence of that. Having strong ESG practices reinforces a company's social license to operate. And it's important, it's as important for large mining companies working offshore that are based here as it is for local tech startups that are disrupting the industry that they're working in and basically you know, leading the changes in regulation and, and almost preceding the changes in regulation and all the cybersecurity issues that may go along with it. Those are all ESG concerns. So seeing what the future might hold using this ESG lens allows us to be able to better assess the risks and the opportunities and that's why companies should want to start to consider an ESG strategy. So effectively organizations can no longer define their own purpose. It's their customers, their investors, the other companies they're doing business with and all other stakeholders who are defining what they want from the businesses they engage with. And companies who don't understand or appreciate this distinction may not be able to survive as we move forward. So the pressure has been on public companies. However, it's really worked its way to private companies, not-for-profit organizations, and small and medium-sized companies. Everyone is part of this larger value chain or part of their own value chain. Every business is tied to another somehow, and the impact each company has will matter in the overall picture. As more and more companies begin to care about this, they'll want to disclose and report on how they're embracing ESG as a business strategy. And the more they'll be evaluated and rated based on their performance and that of their entire value chain. So if you're a company who engages with other companies, and, or if you are one of those companies who want to embrace ESG and you look at the other companies that you're working with, everyone pretty much has to be part of the same momentum or risk being left behind. So if you are an organization or a business that provides products and services to another company or have them provided to you, more will be demanded along the way to make sure that everyone is paying attention to these issues around the environment, society, and governance. So I sort of used the, the example of, you know, imagine you're, you're working with a company that has been found to be polluting the local rivers and lakes purposefully because it's, it's easier and cheaper than having to uh, dispose of their pollutants the, the, you know, the proper way. And um, that company gets found out about. If they're part of your value chain, that impacts you as a company, both from a reputational perspective and eventually from an operational perspective. And so it's important to keep in mind. So when is the right time to start? I would definitely, um, and you may not be surprised to hear this, but I'd say now. Um, the problem is research is showing that many companies don't focus on ESG because there's an assumption that it's too costly or it'll take too many resources to plan and operationalize an ESG policy or, or framework or a process. And honestly, it just isn't true. And Nova Scotia itself is in such a great position to be able to help support this approach and our businesses can have such a positive impact and really be leaders in this space, both in, you know, in our province, in our region and across Canada. We can be in front of our regulators. We know our other business leaders and it's just such a powerful dynamic and ecosystem that we have here that allows us to really be able to create change and momentum. So how do you get started? Uh, I wish I could say there's a one size fits all approach or that there's a checklist that you can go through. Um, but honestly, there, there isn't a one size fits all approach. And if, there, if, if one is suggested, then you may find that it doesn't work. That's why previously, as we talked about, that's why we see so many players in this whole ecosystem because there are so many industries, so many companies, so many levels of maturity of companies and all the issues and the stakeholder concerns are, are so different and so unique. But that said, there is a way to put some structure around it and there is a way to start thinking about it. And so, um, so I pulled together some, some thoughts about what you should be sort of thinking about as, as you're going down this journey. So as you're looking to um, consider adopting sort of that environmental, social and governance lens or perspective or strategy, the, the most important piece is to get the board and an, an executive team engaged in the conversation. 
Sometimes it starts there, but other times it starts within maybe a sustainability team or a legal team or, or, or even just, you know, like on the ground, if, if, you know, employees are seeing that there could be a better way, get that tone set at the top, start talking about the risks around climate, but it doesn't have to be necessarily about scope three greenhouse gas emissions. It could be something as simple as there's a better way for us to, you know, to, to, to dispose of our waste or to reduce how much we produce. You know, the conversations don't have to be, you know, these massive global issues. They can be very real and very practical and very tangible. So start talking about those risks that you may see around climate, um, around social issues, diversity, data security, and governance, and how they may start impacting your business. Again, getting that tone set at the top really does, uh, does start to allow it to permeate better throughout your organization. Next is to develop a base level understanding across the organization. Make sure everybody understands what you mean by ESG. Again, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Does ESG mean reporting? Does it mean just for the investment community? Is it all about corporate social responsibility? Really making sure that everyone has that same understanding of what it is and what it means. And also, because this will be a new conversation potentially, and in some cases it won't be a new conversation, which is fantastic, but if it is, it could start to raise some concerns within your organization that this is something new and scary. We've seen business transition so much over the last year and a half. It's a matter of really, you know, trying to, to bring it in in a, in a very sort of, um, you know, in a very positive way about how it can be, you know, just a, an enabler for wonderful things to move forward with. And so it's really about assessing what you're doing today and then how you should be doing it tomorrow. So next is around uh, engaging the employees around the organization. So going back to alleviating some of the concerns, help make everybody part of the solution. So engaging employees across the organization, will like, like that helps maximize the knowledge and provide a variety of perspectives about what's going on within your company. Cross-functional alignment, across business, across departments, um, across sort of um, like levels of the organization, and even to set up an ESG committee. So that will also help ensure that a rollout or, or a, a conversation happens more, more smoothly. A broad-based committee can support internal communications. They can become the champions for implementing and monitoring some ESG initiatives, and also assist in helping to identify key metrics that you should be looking at, and also help to identify any stakeholder concerns that might be starting to, uh, to, to percolate up. What I would suggest as well, though, is if you are going to go down the committee route to make sure that it's small enough to remain nimble and effective and engaged. The next one is the ESG policy. So the policy is, uh, is that sort of that piece that sets the foundation for your company's ESG program. It should capture your company's so guiding principles, such as values, transparency, integrity, and continuous improvement, and also serve essentially is your North Star to inform and guide your efforts in ESG operations going forward. That policy should also look clearly at who's accountable for the policy and, and where do all the rules and responsibilities fit within it. Um, and, and I'll probably mention this again a couple more times. ESG really is, it, it continues to evolve and, and move. So um, it, it, it can't be just a static um, thought or a static policy that doesn't, that doesn't continue to, to morph. And you'll also need to consider your stakeholders. Which relationships do you most need to manage? Who is impacted by you being in business? And who and what groups can impact you? Think about NGOs, regulators, government, your customers, large advocacy groups. They could all be those stakeholders that you're gonna to wanna to engage with to be able to see what risks you may have facing you that you didn't necessarily um, that, that weren't necessarily apparent before. And also the consideration of materiality is really important. What issues do you most closely need to manage? What are the risks facing your organization? And what are the unintended consequences that maybe you're having on your stakeholders and society and those sorts of things that you as a business may need to start to consider? And a critical piece of the framework or the whole program or process is starting to take a look at what your organization is already doing. You may already be doing a lot of things in the ESG space, and you're just not necessarily looking at them or measuring them or tracking them. 
So starting to bring together all the information that you have, developing one repository, if you will, for all this information to act almost like as a central database. And it needn't be overly complicated at first. Let it be an Excel spreadsheet. You know, I never like to recommend anybody start <laughs> something tracking in an Excel spreadsheet because it can get overwhelming very quickly. But if that's where you need to start, start there. And by being able to bring together information on what you're already doing, it'll help build that momentum towards maybe what you should be doing or want to be doing or what you want to start tracking. Some information may be easy to get, some information may be difficult. So just don't try to boil the ocean at first. Really just start looking at what you're already doing, what your top, top priorities are or should be. And then also consider what information you can have relatively easy access to. And then start building from there. And communication is about telling your ESG story. So share your policy on your website. Tell the world what you're doing around sustainability. Leverage social media or whatever other communication channels you're accustomed to, to using as part of just your day-to-day -day business. Many companies might just start with uh, an ESG section or page on their website or simply post a, a policy or commitment statement saying that we're committed to doing this and we're just starting our journey. Take a look at what some of your peers are doing. So, you know, whether they be competitors or, you know, companies that you collaborate with, get a sense of, of whether or not there's been a bar set. And if it is, what, what does it look like? And see what you can, you can comfortably do. Sometimes not comfortably, but what you can do. <laughs> And um, as part of the communication, it's starting to look at, uh, at disclosures. Your sustainability report is your, your ability to disclose what you're doing. And it shows your efforts around environmental, social, and governance issues. And what I would strongly recommend, as would anyone working in this space, is that your reporting and communication on ESG issues needs to be balanced. You need to be able to show your success, of course, and celebrate that and measure it and show the path that you're on, but also be willing to say where there is your path to do better. So set your metrics and targets about how you're going to get to where your ultimate end state is. And of course, that'll probably continue to move as you continue to mature. Um, and where you haven't met your targets and you haven't um, achieved what you set out to do in a given year or given reporting time frame. Just explain why and then how you're going to, to address that moving forward. No one's going to get this right the first time. Some companies take years to be able to really get this right and embed it in their organization the way they want to. It's starting somewhere and being willing to start small and be willing to start, basically just be willing to start it is the big piece. And then finally, as I said before, um, ESG is all about creating resilient businesses that can withstand what might lie ahead and no longer being able to predict the future based on what we've seen in the past because that's, that won't work any longer with climate change and everything being around us. So there needs to be ongoing oversight and monitoring. Environmental scans and continued stakeholder engagement are essential. ESG issues will continue to evolve, and what's a top priority for your stakeholders today may not be tomorrow. And the leading business risk that's keeping you awake, that, well, that kept you awake last night, may pale in comparison to what's on the horizon. And uh, COVID has definitely taught us that. So, so just being able to make sure that your, your strategy is resilient and allow you to be able to withstand the changes that may be on the horizon and the risks that um, some of which hopefully through going through this process will allow you to start to see and then also to prepare for those you, you don't necessarily know exactly what, what they are. So looking at some of the risks and pitfalls that I, I just want to sort of raise as, as awareness is um, in undertaking the development of an ESG framework or strategy, a potential risk lies within reputation. If your company's efforts around ESG are perceived as greenwashing or as an effort to mislead the public um, around what you're actually doing as far as, uh, as um, impact on the environment in a positive manner, you could be exposing yourself to reputation, a reputational hit. So instead, develop your communication strategy um, and engage your board and senior leadership. Make sure you have their buy-in. And after you've got that sort of firm foundation in place, 
then perhaps start to um, introduce to, to your broader community that you're beginning this ESG journey. Another potential risk is a company not living up to its policy statements. For example, let's say um, you set some greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, and then you repeatedly miss them without good reason and without any indication about how you're going to fix it or how you're going to um, restructure operations to make sure that that problem, um, if you will, doesn't continue. The company and its leadership will be in a very awkward position when it's asked to explain. So what it ends up doing is it ends up just um, making it seem like you're not authentic or that you didn't truly take it, take it seriously and it was just you know lip service or again greenwashing. So again, I, I would strongly encourage you not to set up too much for yourself. Don't, don't be afraid to start small because companies can often want to take on too much, set too many metrics, too many targets, and then they start focusing on just these ESG targets and not looking at how it truly pertains to the entire picture. So really just looking at E, S, and G as three sort of perhaps, you know, buckets or pillars. And then what can you do within each to start the journey? You know, what can you do to try to have a more positive impact on the environment or start to enhance the, 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 the social um, issues that your organization could be contributing to either positively or negatively? And regarding the communication strategy, especially as it relates to the external communication strategy, be mindful of the risk of posting initiatives on your website or social media or broadly communicating them before you actually have much in the way of results to actually talk about. Again, it speaks to this, the, the sincerity and the intention behind your company's, company's efforts around ESG. Sort of one of the things, you know, you, you put up this wonderful policy of all the things you're going to do, but there's nothing quite in place yet to do them. And we are seeing that with some of um, some large um, some large institutions are sort of coming up with these wonderful broad policy statements saying we are embracing it and we're going to do this, but we're not seeing any, any actions taken or any plans. And so it can definitely work against you. So just uh, to be mindful of that. And again, I can't say it enough, don't overcommit. Getting started is so important, but it's easy to get overwhelmed and to look for perfection right off the bat. And it's, this is definitely one of those areas where perfection can definitely be the enemy of good. <laughs> so just to be, uh, to be mindful of that. And then finally, in looking at some of the outcomes that you can expect from this, um, I think a lot of this is, hopefully it doesn't seem repetitive, but improve stakeholder engagement. You're going to see stronger relationships that are with those that are the most important to your business. It will, and, and also by having those stronger relationships and having that increased engagement, it will enhance your market knowledge. It'll also help with priority setting because through this ESG lens, you're gonna be more focused on the material issues and those topics that face your business and those that'll have the most impact. Establishing ESG targets is the first step towards measuring the impact that your company is having or that you want it to have. And then starting to be able to track your progress around meeting goals and the ESG priority uh, areas. Is that old, you know, saying what gets measured gets done. And then when you look at risk identification and management, through the process of looking through this ESG lens, as I continue to call it, you'll be viewing your business from a different perspective. You're going to be able to start to see hidden risks that otherwise you wouldn't have anticipated. And again, keeping in mind, we can't continue to look at the past to predict the future because what's happening, we have no precedent for. We've not seen climate change like this. The social issues that are coming to light, the, the immediacy of information and what we have access to, it's, we're, we're almost changing things as we go. And, and regulation can only do so much and it can only move so quickly. So really using this ESG lens to, to really to get there and to, uh, to start looking to try to predict and get some, some thoughts about what's coming down the pipe. And then what that will also do is not necessarily just expose hidden risks, but it's also going to allow you to uncover new and innovative opportunities. Because risk and opportunity is, is, is it's, it's one coin. It's how you look at it and what you can do with it most times. And through a broader ESG strategy and focus, you're looking beyond financial performance alone. So you're going to be able to really see and appreciate the impact your company is having on its stakeholders and the environment and, and vice versa, it on you as well. 
And then finally, through sustainability reporting, if and when you get there, or even just by putting up some, some general information, um, you know, let's say on your website or through social media, you're increasing your degree of transparency with your stakeholders. You're willing to share information about your company, which quite frankly, they could probably get anyway, but you're now controlling your message and being open and transparent. And by doing that, you're creating a higher degree of engagement with your customers, your employees, your investors, other companies you do business with. And that builds trust. And then once you get to that point, then you start to have a really engaged business relationship that is sustainable and will be more resilient over time. So a concluding thought. So whenever I, I do any sessions like these, I always like to leave some everyone with a takeaway. Now we aren't in person, so I can't actually give it to you. But um, I read this book a few months ago and I just felt like it was an excellent overview of the sustainability journey. It's kind of our path, how we got here, some things, and then also where we're going. And I, I actually liked it so much, I reached out to the authors and I just, you know, sent them a note and told them what I thought about their book. And now we are in, you know, quite regular communication. We're working on a couple of areas where we're going to start to collaborate. So these two authors are actually from the US, but now they're living in Japan. And they created a consultancy in, in Japan. And it's amazing how the issues that they're dealing with, some of them are so much more ahead of where we are and some are sort of catching up. So it's just, it, it's fascinating. But all I have to say, I have two copies that I'd like to offer as a thank you for attending this session. And so the only way I can think about being fair about how to get this book into the hands of only two of you is um, if you could give some thought to what you took away from the workshop or even more so what you want to learn more about. My fear, of course, is that this just opened up a whole can of worms of, of confusion, what you want to learn more about. So the first two people who can give some thought to that and, and put that in the chat, um, those first two people, again, what you took away from today or what you want to learn more about, the first two people will get a copy of the book. And so I'm going to leave it to Emma to be able to determine who actually got there first. But the books will be sent directly through you. There is a bit of a delay um, through Amazon. So they'll be sent directly to you um, from there. So I don't need to ask the chamber for that favor. So um, yeah, so with that, I guess I want to say thank you. I think we do have um, just right around 15 minutes to be able to have some Q&A. I haven't been able to monitor the chat, but I do see that there's a few in there. So hopefully, um, and I can sort of just let me know if there's any questions that we can, we can talk about. So thank you, there she is. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was fabulous. Um, it's great to learn about this topic because it is so prevalent right now. Everything that we do in business has to be a little more socially conscious, environmentally conscious. So this is great to learn about. We really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to start with uh, Paula's question. What size of companies, or maybe by measure of employee numbers, does this start to make sense in terms of cost and benefit? I know small companies can benefit, but they don't generally have the human resources, time or money to really dive into ESG work. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I personally believe, and, uh, and, and I'll start by saying there's no, there's no magical size. So if you're a really small company, let's say you're just starting to build, you're in that startup phase, of course, there's this mindset, I just need to get clients, I just need to get customers, I just need to start the, the ball rolling. And, but if you can, at that time, start thinking about what will your structure look like? Do you have an advisory board? Do you have a governing board? What are your employee policies like? What are you going to expect of people? Even in your office, if we ever return to an office, um, what will your just recycling program look like? Will you have a work from home policy to be able to allow employees to stay at home and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from driving back and forth to work every day? What will be that integration you have with your communities? Who are you going to do business with? How will you pick your suppliers? Will they be local? Will they be, you know, ordering something online from an international company? All of those pieces, they help form your policies around ESG and they can start from day one. Because if they're ignored and you're just focused on the next customer or the next round of financing, and you don't worry about all those things, you may not necessarily be able to attract the right talent because they won't see you as, a, as an organization or a company with that structure or with that positive energy that's going to lead you to that next phase. So just getting some basic structure in there that do look at it from that 
environmental, greater society and strong governance, and even a, a code of ethics. All those sorts of things can be brought in at a relatively low expense. It, and, and it doesn't take that much time. It's just getting it in there early and then you can just let it grow because it won't ever be a good time. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, that was a great answer. There won't ever be enough time. That's absolutely it. It's all <laughs> priority. <laughs> can attest to that for sure. Um, I just want to read some of the comments here. So one of the biggest takeaways for Angela was be realistic, start small, don't overcommit. I love that. Uh, and what we want to learn more about is how to incorporate this into your organization without a budget to start. So I feel like you kind of touched on that. Is there anything else you want to add on that? Uh, yeah, it, it's if um, yeah, because not all of this means you have to go out and okay, I'm going to say you don't have to go and hire a consultant to come in here and do all of this. Like I said, yes, yeah, start small and just start to look at what what matters the most. Talk to your stakeholders. Look internally. Look at the risks that you have facing facing you. And, and do some reading and look at what your competitors or your peers are doing. And that's a great way to start. And you can just get a, an internal team together to start working on it. And again, keeping in mind one of those sort of risks that I had mentioned though, just make sure that you don't overcommit or over publicize what you're doing until you're sure that you can start to create some momentum and start to, to get some of those actions in place. Perfect, that's great. Um, we talked about this throughout, but we wanna know a little more about how important it is for leaders to incorporate their entire teams into this process. So especially for coming at it from the small business perspective where maybe you don't have that board and maybe you don't have that top-down hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you can touch on that a little. Yeah, um, you know, and I'm not sure if this is kind of where the question is getting to, but sometimes it becomes that, that cultural conversation. Like we have a, a culture issue where we've always, we've always done it this way, this is great. It, you know, or um, our company's doing well, we, we tick off our boxes at the end of it to say that we're not causing any harm and we are doing great things. But to get it really embedded in your strategy, even if you don't have a board, then I, I think the question actually almost provided the answer as well is getting your teams involved. If you're a small organization, especially if it's a young organization, you might find you've already got so much commitment and, and will to want to pursue some, some initiatives in this area. So just start looking at it. Start looking at what does your what does your lunchroom look like? You know, are you using you know plastic bottles or do you have a water system in place? If you are forcing everyone to come into the office, well, not right now, but if you are going to force everyone to come back to the office, think about whether or not you have to. If you are a small company but you're doing a lot of international travel or business travel, do you need to do that? And and if you can actually get your your whole you know even a department, even if it's like a bit larger and you're going across different departments. But get different teams even who can start to think about this. You might find it just ends up becoming a really energizing project as well. So it's, it starts with, again, maybe a first step in this case, if it's a small company, is maybe just do a lunch and learn session, bring somebody in or do a webinar or just talk about it. Um, but you know, like a lunch and learn session is a great way to just get everyone on the same page about what it means. And then as soon as you know what something means, you understand it, you can start to see yourself in it. And that might be a, a way to go as well. I hope that answered the question. Absolutely, that's great. Um, I'm gonna read out another big takeaway. Um, all the organization involved in the ESG disclosure ecosystem and how we're starting to see convergence. And I'd like to learn more about the different paths for companies to capture and disclose data effectively. Love that. Okay. Um, I have another question. I'm just trying to find it. Oh, can you tell us some examples of companies who are doing a really good job at their ESG strategy? Sorry, put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I apologize that it's it's one that um, I think we all know of, but it's not local, but I, it just popped in my head and I can't seem to get it out of there. But you look at a company like Patagonia. I mean, they have been some of the leaders in this and they have in, you know, in, and they've even taken the ESG piece to a whole other level and they're trying to create this concept of a circular economy. Like they want to reward you for not wanting to discard your clothing. They want you to send it back so you can fix it. They look at their supply chain and every element of their supply chain and see how they are interacting with the environment and with society. And they've taken it one step further as well. And they've um, been one of the larger organizations to sign on to be a B Corp, B standing for benefit. So to be a B Corp, you're actually embedding in your, in your actual regulations of the certain commitments that you're willing to make around that environmental, social, and governance piece. So yeah, I mean, there's some wonderful things. We're also seeing too, like, you know, a national bank has put out its uh, ESG report 
And it's just a lot of great stuff in there. BlackRock, of course, has, it, has its. Um, but, you know, like a lot of companies are really starting to, to look at, um, at really building this in. I had a conversation actually with a gentleman over um, just in, in uh, New Brunswick. So major drilling, they have like, you know, look at their website. They've got their policy right on the website as well. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of work going into it. And a lot of companies are really taking a, um, just sort of like a, a customized approach. Um, one company I know is starting to look to, to walk down that path of um, the TCFD or that climate, the, the climate disclosures. And because climate disclosures can quite often be a little bit sort of qualitative at first and how, where do you start? So you sort of supplement it with an, another framework that might be a little bit more grounded in, in an actual tangible quantitative measures. So there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on for sure. Um, I guess it depends on the industry and, and the size of company, but those are a couple of examples that just sort of come to mind. And as soon as I, I get off this webinar, I'm going to think of about 10 more. So I, I apologize. <laughs> no, that's perfect. I, well, while you said B Corp, that reminded me that we do have a local, there's only a few people in Atlanta Canada who are certified B Corps, but mm -hmm. made with local is one of them. So they would fall into that. And mm -hmm. I was thinking of the tear shop um who's all about sustainability and i get uh, a lot of my cleaning products from there and oh, i've been using okay. the same giant tide uh laundry detergent thing for yeah. almost a year now whereas usually i would have bought like 15 of them by now let's say so <laughs> they great. are uh, yeah they're great to have in the neighborhood and one more question here and then i think we'll wrap up if we don't have any further ones after this any resources you can recommend for people to find more information on where to start their esg apology uh yourself included <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, with that, I mean, there's one thing that there's no shortage of is information out there and it is overwhelming and it's enough to make, there have been some days where, you know, your, your head could just explode. There's so much great information out there. Um, I'd be happy, like if anybody wants to follow up, my email address is here and this is just, I, I'm happy to do it. I can, you know, if you, if you were sort of, sort of going down one path or another, I'd be happy to send you um, some information so you could just get in touch with me. Like if you're sort of more concerned around um, starting your patches in a generic sense, I can uh, send you some, some information to start that. If you're starting to think about um, starting to report or starting on policy development, I can also send you some information. There's a ton, very high level and very detailed. And, um, you know, just, just let me know, shoot, shoot me off an email and, uh, and I'd be happy to get in touch with you. And give you some information. Perfect. That is great. Thank you so much, Nancy. We're just about at 11 here. So I'm going to wrap it up. I'll keep an eye on the chat in case anything else pops up as I go through here. So first of all, thank you so much for walking us through ESG. This is a super important topic. We're going to be hearing more and more about it. It's only get, it's going to increase in popularity and importance. So uh, get in with Nancy now. <laughs> <laughs> um, join us again this afternoon. We're hosting a webinar with Minister Hussein, the Federal Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development. It's today at 4 p.m. And he's going to be talking about the new budget and what that means for families, for daycares, and all the other great stuff they put into the budget this year. This webinar was recorded and will be available to all attendees shortly on YouTube. Have a great day, everyone. I think the sun is shining out there. Haven't been outside yet, but I am um, hopeful. And Nancy, final thought? I have one more thing. Who gets yeah. the books? Because there's two books. Oh, God, and there's yes, a few to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> I almost forgot the books. Yes, it was Melanie. Okay, sorry, before I say anything out loud. Yep, Melanie and Paula. Okay, great. Okay, well, Melanie and Paula, I hope you like it. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> All right, I'll make note of that and we will get them their books. Okay, great. Okay, Perfect. super. Thank, Thank you. you all Thanks, so much. everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.